It's Thursday, June 26th. I'm Scott. I'm Rim. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, the darkness that comes before. Let's do this. Well, here we are. It's Thursday, and like we said way back, we're continuing with the uh, the lounge, I guess. Thursdays are different. Thursdays are special. Thursdays are not your typical episode of Geek Nights. Yep, Rim wanted a cop out of doing the promised book club. I did not want to Bring, cop out. Bringing up many excuses about people not reading, not wanting to talk about all three books, but I'm forcing it. We're going to do the book club as planned. And See, at the end of this episode, we're going to tell you what the next book is going to be. To clarify, I was not attempting to cop out. I was merely noting that... Our original plan of having a round table and other plans we had to do this show kind of fell through because huh? no one actually wanted to do that. Oh, you see, I actually went back and I listened to uh, the Dodgeball episode, last Thursday's episode, where we talked, where we said that we were going to do the uh, book club, the second book club episode right now. And uh, we said very specifically that we couldn't have that whole round table unless we were going to talk about all three books because people would spoil it up the whatnot. Yeah, well, that so, was a fair. We could have had it. We would have had to pick very handcrafted people. Yes. Yeah, so because we're only going to talk about the one book, uh, the round table's not going to happen. But regardless, uh, we're going to continue. Well, the round table might happen in the future, but not right now. We're going to do it at some point because I have a lot to say about these books. And I can people, I just, the re main reason I want to have it is not because I feel like I, I want to say a lot, but just because all these people in the front row crew can't shut up about it. And uh, I, want it I want everyone to just get it out of their system all at once. Well, and you then see, you can shut up and maybe read some other books. What's been happening with The Prince of Nothing is that it's read by like a group, a couple people. And then it gets read by this other wave of people. And then this other wave of people. And, and like six waves of this have been rolling through the front row crew. And as a result, the books are always topical. And every time the crew gets together, someone who has just started reading the book will always get the conversation with someone who read it before along the lines of, you have no idea. Oh, man, when so-and-so did such and such. Oh, wait till so-and-so does the mm -hmm. thing I can't tell you about. Yeah. Oh. Well, why do you think it is? Here, let's let's start our book club discussion of The Darkness That Comes Before by R. Scott Backer. Why do you think it is that these books, I mean, we've read a lot of books in common, right? Plenty of them. We've read plenty of books in our lives. I mean, yes. uh, why is it that these books uh, get so much conversation and so much desire to have conversation with uh, others who have read it uh, among our crew and other people. It's weird how unhesitant I am to say this. I mean, people who know me more uh, more closely than maybe through Geek Nights might know this, but the rest of you, I'm very finicky about all my entertainment, and I generally dislike almost every entertaining thing I'm confronted with. Yeah, people uh, act like I'm the one who's all hating on everything, well, the thing is actually the one who's hating. But I don't hate on, I just note that I do not find a lot of things terribly engaging. Uh, so I guess the difference is, is mo I think the, that actually is mostly in the expression. Like, when you don't like something, you're like, yeah, I don't like that. When I don't like something, I say, it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> you go one step further. It's like I say, eh, I didn't particularly enjoy that. I think it was poorly written. You say, it sucks, and you're all stupid for liking it, and I hate you, and I had sex with your mom. Uh, I think I stopped, like, uh, two and a half steps shorter than that, but... Yeah. Well, anyway. you, well, you skip to the big finish with the mom and whatnot. Anyway. And so I think for one, I, I, but like I said, I'm surprisingly unhesitant to say this, but these books are well written to a degree that was startling. Yeah. I, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's like when I'm reading them, it's not just the, the choice of words. Well, I guess it is just the choice of words, technically speaking. But the, <laughs> the way diction. in which it is written, right? It's sort of like when I read a Tezuka manga, right? It's like the combination of the words and the graphics creates this sort of, you know, cinematic kind of experience, right? But there's something about the, the way he writes the words in these books where I can sort of almost get that same cinematic experience during some scenes well, this, that I wouldn't get and, and a lot of other books just don't give. That brings up pretty much the foremost reason I think that these are so well written. The thing that really stands out and you look at like other fantasy works like Tolkien and are a lot, you know, the things are very descriptive. It'll go on and on about how the detailed well, description Tolkien is of, very, Tolkien's very sort of flowery and prosy and, and, and poetry wise. Oh yeah, but in general a lot of, he also is very exquisite he fills things with detail that 
I ended up skipping a lot of, I'll admit, openly. Well, I, don't, this, I think there's the people who go a lot more into the intricate oh, details oh, there than are. Tolkien. There are. I'm trying to keep this show accessible. Perhaps, perhaps to some to certain deceased people. Possibly. Uh, yeah. But anyway. With wheels. <laughs> ah, the wheels. <laughs> I want a heron blade so ma- so badly. Or at least I did heron want a spear, heron blade. Heron spear, good God. Heron spear. I think the heron spear beats out the heron blade. Well, <laughs> heron spear's the win. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> anyway, but they're not, they're very, very descriptive, these books and this writing, but they're not descriptive in the kind of expected way of you describe in stupid detail the color of this and the relief here and this and that, and there were five leaves on this tree that was almost out of leaves. Well, I think I think that is one reason where, you know, I'm usually, sorry, I mean, I like me a fantasy book, don't get me wrong, but I think a lot of the fantasy books and a lot of fantasy fandom in general is really heavy on this, on the idea of setting. They want detail in the setting, you know? What what kind of, they like, they like you know, for, I mean, look at the Forgotten Realms type stuff. Where are all the, the how what's the map of the town you know where are all the buildings what well, are the people like Who's i think in fantasy building? authors tend to get really caught up in their own world they do they do and but it's all it's it ends up being more about the world whereas which would be fun i mean there's fun. nothing wrong with the story about the world no, i think no. it's just that they get caught up in the world and focused on the world and a lot of poorly written fantasy novels tend to focus on mm-hmm. the details that no one else cares about. Right. Whereas in the Prince of Nothing uh, series, there is a world, and it is as big a world as there are in so- in those other fantasy novels that are world heavy. You know, I mean, look, you have this holy war marching, right? And there are this 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 giant empire with all these different kingdoms, and each kingdom has different people. There's there's the one kingdom where the people wear masks. Uh, there's the other kingdom where the guys are sort of like uh, Highlanders uh, almost. Well, well, actually, uh, we don't really need to get into this, but the the nations of the world are very explicitly and directly based upon cultures from certain eras in history in that area. Yeah, it's sort of obvious. Um, Scythians and such. Yes, but they don't actually. They don't, he doesn't spend a lot of words describing to you, like, you know, these are the so and so's from the so and so. He sort of just throws the proper nouns out there, right? He just names the people and he's like, he's like, yeah, these are those people, the so and so people. And you just, you see them and it's like the so and so people walked into the room with their srank heads hanging from ropes around their waist. So it's like, ah, so those are sort of more, you know, barbaric kind of guys. Yeah, well, I think part of that is that as a result, you end up, you learn a lot about the world naturally as though you were there. It's like if you were in this world and you did not know these things, you would learn about them in this kind of natural way just from speaking and talking and the dialogue in these books is very natural with one great exception but that exception is callous and it's actually very Uh, natural which makes it very unnatural (laughs) i think the other thing is that this book right i I look at the books you know and you you take like say a literature class how do you write a book well you could write a book in the first person you know you could write a book from a narrator you could have an unreliable narrator you could have you know all these different ways to write uh, a novel right the way this these books are written is you have an unreliable well they're not really it's not really an unreliable narrator it is a reliable narrator but the narrator changes it's always in the first person but who that person is changes and whenever you'll go through the book and you'll be reading and say it's from the point of view of a, a of a camion a camion then you'll see like dot 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 and then suddenly you're picking right up and it's from the point of view of Nair. And then there's dot, 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 and maybe, or maybe the next chapter. And it's from the point of view of Esmond. Now, and- this is very important. And there's a lot of subtlety in what happens as a result. Because, one, there is no objective narrator. I mean, the closest thing to an objective narrator you have is Kellis, the nominal protagonist. Even though I would argue that Akamian is the protagonist of these books. Uh, it, it, well, you it know depends what? on you know, which I'll, book. I'll go one step further. The Prince of Nothing series, the darkness that comes before and these other two books, uh, they break a lot of the tropes of literature and that it's difficult to say if there even is a protagonist. Yeah, it is definitely difficult. I mean, at least in the class, I mean, there are a lot of ways, criteria you can use to determine, you know, who's the main character. Oh, yes. It's like, who says there has to be a main character? There's main characters. They're all sort of equal. You know, which is why I think it actually gives me a, a really sort of 
burning wheel kind of feel or like you know any sort of good tabletop rpg where there's no main character it's the people you know the actual pcs as opposed to the npcs are the player characters they're all equal protagonists and everyone else is a non-player character but this is where the subtlety comes in and i don't think it could have been pulled off from any other perspective but you only ever see this world through the perspectives of the characters you're always inside their heads so whenever a scene is described one you're getting it from this one character's perception so everything is kind of filtered through them and you see their experiences and most of the narration is not objective he did this she did that it's i saw him do this i see him doing that it's weird how one second you could be in a character's head right you know seeing everything they think seeing everything they see see hearing everything they hear the next second, you'll be in another character's head. In the look, same scene. Looking at the character you were just inside of and not in, and sort of questioning, like, oh, what's that guy up to? It's like I was just in his head, and now I'm questioning what he's up to, even though I just was in there and I saw what he was thinking. But I guess this, the, the importance of this is that the whole idea of Kellis and what Kellis is I don't think could have been done eloquently or with any true justice if not for this switching of perspective because you kind of, everyone's perspective is flawed and then you hit Kellis and his perspective is perfect, which is frightening a lot of the time because the world is so completely and utterly different and alien from his perspective compared to everyone else's. I think what's also amazing about the way Kellis is written is that He's written so as to be so transhumanist, to be so it's like he has superpowers beyond, you know, what people have. It's not something that a human being in the real world can do. It's almost beyond comprehension. Yet, Transhuman is definitely the word. Uh, Hannibal Lecter is yes. very close to Kellis. Yet when you're in his mind, seeing what he sees, thinking what he thinks, hearing what he hears, you can comprehend it. You know, you, you it's, it's, it's plain as day and it's plainly obvious of, of what's going on and how, you know, but how, there's actually what he's thinking, what he's doing. Yet, how can you comprehend it when it's so far above you? And it's it it really traps your mind in a way because you're in his head. There's a brilliant scene that actually is it's not almost as if he is you know fooling you inside of his own head, like he knows you're there. Oh, I'll talk about that in a second. But there's a brilliant scene. It's actually in one of the later books, so I won't speak on it. But all I want to say is that Nair, the barbarian, he. Is awesome, but also not awesome. He's awesome in the way that Mr. Tokai is awesome. Exactly. But that's beside the point. But if, whenever you're in Callus's head, all of his planning and like his courses of action seem obvious. In fact, they seem almost predestined. Like, what other choice could he have made? But then later, you're in Nair's head, and he is in a situation that you would expect Kellis to be in. And Nair trying to figure out what to do. I have the same information that Kellis had when I was in Kellis' head about, in, about a similar situation. But now I'm in Nair's head, and not only can Nair not figure out what to do, but I can't figure out what to do. Yep. It's pretty amazing. But in terms of fooling, because you're in from everyone's perspectives, one, you, you get very intimated with all of the characters. I mean, you by the end of the, especially by the end of the trilogy, I, I, you feel as though you know these characters in a very visceral sense. I Another, mean, what, see, it's like I know them really well. But, but I don't same, identify with them. Well, I don't identify with them. But well, I identify with parts of each. You know, it's sort of like I'll listen to some podcasts out there that have like a cast. You know, they have a lot more than two hosts. And it's like there's no one person on the cast which I identify with. But like one person, I'll really identify with them on one aspect. But I'll disagree with them on some other aspect. You know, and the Prince of Nothing's the same way. It's like Nair... His, his untrustingness of Kellis and his refusal to be fooled and his, and his skepticism and his seeing right through the bullshit, I totally identify with. His barbarism and other such, not identify. But remember, there's a difference between understanding a character, identifying with a character, and feeling as though you know a character. Mm -hmm. Because by being in their heads, by being in all the... I mean, if it was just... The whole book was from one character's perspective in one character's head. Then you would be intimate with this character, but it wouldn't be apparent and it wouldn't mean anything. But the fact that you're in everyone's heads, you start to... There's, all, there's this beautiful tragedy to say something that a non-man would say in that you'll see a character and in there'll be in their head and they want something desperately from another character or they love this character. 
And then you're in this other character's head. And they love the first character. And yet, when you're in a third character's head and you see these two interacting, you realize what's going on, but you're powerless to stop it. Mm, mm. Like, you know, you're more intimate with the characters than any of them ever could be with each other. With the possible exception of, again, a scene from the third book where someone is reading a book about the ancient histories of the world, you know, the original Mm. apocalypse, and then, this is a little nod to the people who've read all three books, and then realizes exactly who another character was and what he meant and what he he was, but it was almost too too late. late. (laughs) Too late. All right, so let's let's start getting some nitty gritty. So the the first I got, we got to talk about. All right, let's let's go to some big scenes and then talk about their meanings and such. Yes, right? and let's skip over the ones we talked about right away. In the when well, we did we talk it. about? We, did we talk about the whole issue all thing in the begin at the very very beginning? I believe we did, but we could talk about that again because right. that, uh, if nothing else. This is one of those books where the, you know, call me Ishmael, the opening sentence. I never read the, the call. Oh, wait, no, never mind. What were you going to (laughs) say? What were you going to say? Call me Ishmael. I was like, I was like, at at first I was like, (laughs) I got confused. I was like, oh yeah, I never read that book called call me Ishmael. I was like, no, wait a minute. (laughs) 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 <laughs> One cannot raise walls against what has been forgotten. Yeah. That that line is is very, very important. Yeah. All right. So the book opens, right? And basically it's the end of the world, but it's it's they call it the end of the world. It's an apocalypse, right? But it's not the real end of the world where everyone dies. It's just lots of horrible shit going it's down. It's almost like in a way, this book begins where at the point where a lot of fantasy books would skip. Yeah. See, that's one of those things where I'm always upset with pretty much every fantasy trilogy. I mean, you read The Lord of the Rings, but all the big powered stuff with hundreds of dragons and hundreds of Balrogs and tons of wizards and all that craziness happened way before. See, I I disagree with your idea that those books would be good because... I don't think I'm not saying really... they would be good. I'm just saying I always want them. Yeah, you want them because the, you know, the good you books, that? the you good books that? make you want those other books you that aren't that? good. You want that? You really do? You want that? <laughs> no, but the good, I will good books book. make you want that. Yes, but I will give you a book that will make you realize that that is not probably in fact some what Dragonlance book. In fact, I was going to say the Dragonlance books probably because That's they a notice I don't like those books. <laughs> those books are some of the worst books they're ever so written. Bad. Good God! Well, they're no Ethan from oh. oh. Ooh. All right. Have all right. you ever actually read Ethan Frome? Yes. Okay. It's boring. Guy goes down a hill in a sled and hurts himself. All right. <laughs> Rosebud. No, it's not. Okay. Yes. So, so check it out. It's like almost the end of the world. These people, the king from a giant, awesome kingdom, has a castle hidden away, and he runs away to that castle. The citadel of Ishual succumbed during the height of the apocalypse. Exactly. But no army of inhuman strength had scaled its ramparts. And it's really. It's really subtle because they put the years in sort of like these headlines. 2147, Year of the Tusk, the Mountains of Demora. Right. Demua. Yeah. So, but like at first I was like, uh, you know, because not, it's not a huge, it's not an earth, you know, year system. So I wasn't sure. I'm like, is that the year? Does they measure it in days? What's their, what's their system for measuring these things? You know, I'm like, maybe it wasn't actually a thousand years later. Oh, no, it was a thousand years later. Because that's They're the not- thing. We said this when we are selling the book to you, but the fact that the second chapter starts late autumn, 4109 year of the Tusk. Yeah. And Because even- I was thinking, oh, maybe maybe it's sort of like a Chinese thing where it's year of the Tusk, the next year is like, you know, year of the horn, and then the year after that is year of the tail. But and I was more- like, oh, exactly, 2,000 years later, it's even now the more- Tusk again. And like it wasn't necessarily confusing, but there was a moment of wait a minute when Mo you start to realize that Moengus was Kellis's father yep. because Moengus went out and he traveled and he you know he made Nair what he was, and then Kellis runs into Nair and there's again that brilliant scene where Nair sees Kellis he sees Moengus yep and uh, he's he's as confused as I am. <laughs> All right. So, but then are... when, but then at the same time, then right along, right there, you see Kellis seeing Nair and realizing what right away that Moengus has trained him. Yep, he knows what I am. 
Well, because they're talking about the trackless step and such, right? Oh, the trackless step. We need, I think we need to talk a little bit about the trackless and step. And the thing is, is when, you know, Kellis is walking down his trackless step, but then he sees that all of his tracks... Uh, that this Nair has been put on his tracks by Moengus. He's like, ah. He had conquered the darkness that came before he believed, but then Moengus came before, and throughout the whole first book, you always see this kind of conflict, possibly the only conflict at all within Kellis, which is, I am following this path that my father laid out before me. Did my father come before? Do I have any choice in the matter? But it's interesting because he's not questioning it. He's not thinking... Do I have a choice in the matter? He's thinking, I am following this path. Yep. It's 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 very strange how he how he can note realize that he might have an option, but yet he accepts that he has no options. Yep. Uh oh, I was gonna say something awesome. All right, so yeah, so the title of the book, The Darkness That Comes Before, so clever. So clever. I mean at the first, you think, oh, the darkness that comes before. It's probably, you know, some evil guys coming up, doing some evil, bad, dark evil. Or you could even think it was followed something. Followed by the other things. You could even think it was something straight up. The darkness that comes before is the apocalypse before the rebirth. In all sorts of ways. Yep. But no, the the, the theme of Kellis and the Dunyan and the whole deal is, you know, that what comes before determines what comes after and not vice versa. Now, think you know, about logic, that for a minute. Cause and effect. You don't have effects causing causes it's cause followed by effect so if you are come before the cause control the causes are the causes know what the causes are then the the effects you own them you the you you know so the darkness that comes before is a dark thing that controls the causes it comes before everyone else's causes and therefore determines the effects. and it's the darkness merely because if you can't see what came before you cannot know what will come after you can only guess yeah, it's not and it's as not result, necessarily dark because it's evil it's, no, it's dark, dark because, because you, you can't, can't see it you can't see it as what a result, can you see you're mastered by it. what do you see what do you see what do you see uh, <laughs> uh, but the, it, are there any what do you sees in the first book i forget yes but anyway Think about this for a minute before we even go any further, because th what makes these books so appealing is they bring up very difficult, very complex issues. And like most of my favorite literature, they give you get no answers. <laughs> you get no. Oh, well, the answer is this or this is the moral. The moral is, well, that's what happened. Not only do you not get much answers on, you know, the philosophical sense, but you uh, don't get a great deal of satisfaction in the literal sense either. I mean, they look, set you up with all this shit like, you know, a Kamian can cast wicked, crazy spells of death dealing. Hey, you know, there's like, you know, this consult that's kind of evil and possibly scary. But that even better than that, like, look at a Kamian, right? You don't even know that. The only in indication you have that he is as powerful as he might really be is that there's a few scenes where someone uh, puts forth some indignity upon him, and he just thinks to himself that he could destroy this entire place and walk through the ashes yeah. of what remained. It's kind of it's kind of weird because at first, in the early part of the book, right, he's in that town and uh, he, he sort of he's spying around, right, in the in the town where the Scarlet Spires sort of own. Ah, with with uh, right. what's his name? That spy who gets. Shanked he right gets, away. He gets pwned, right? So at that point, I I sort of felt like a, a commune was sort of like a weaker, you know, mage of sorts. You know, that it, he didn't seem like he was such a powerful guy. It seemed like he was sort of spying, staying hidden. He was scared of the Scarlet Spires coming down on him, you know? So I didn't really understand, you know, just what his power was, you know? And he, the nightmare thing sort of made him feel kind of weak, like, you know, he has this big weakness, but, you know, as they're like, you know, you know, the Gnosis is the serious business. I'm like, oh, so it is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, think about the idea of causality. And that's what these books are in, in many ways about. If everything is a product of the things that came before it, then is there any possibility of free will or options? Because, I mean... It, 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 if one thing begets another thing and another thing begets another thing and, you know, I, I hit a ball and the ball rolls down, hits another ball and the ball moved because I hit it and I hit it because of electrical impulses in my brain and that brain exists because of millions of years of evolution and all the way back. Is there free will and can there be free will? Mm -hmm. And this is a book that addresses that straight up.
Yep. And the thing is, is whether there is free will or not, right? Some people are able to see what's going on and other people can't see what's going on. Well, they can And perhaps the people that can see, you know, perhaps they can actually, maybe they have free will and others do not. And perhaps they control the wills of others. Or maybe it just appears that way because they can see what's going on. Well, that definitely, there is, the, the one thing I really wish we could talk about more is the Dunyane themselves because it isn't until the second book where we learn in somewhat frightening detail exactly how the Dunyain came to be the way they are. And it's, pretty fri- it's pretty frightening. Neuropuncture. Yeah, it's pretty scary. The, the, I mean, it, it, this is the I kind think of the, thing... I think that the training with the faces was even scarier. Yes, but this is the kind of thing where a typical fantasy book would just kind of gloss over that or just, oh, a wizard did it. But no, in here, it's explained scientifically to a degree that is frightening because it's so plausible. Yeah, it's it's pretty plausible. It's, pl- it's not super plausible. Well, you know, no, it, the, the, it's I, as plausible as Hannibal Lecter is. No, so. not 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 the Dunyane mm. themselves, but the experimentation and how they learn the things oh, they do. Oh, 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 yeah, that yeah. is plausible. I guess it is. Modern science, and especially as time goes on, could probably do things like that. Probably, I mean, it wouldn't. It might not. We might not be able to have the same effect, but you know, it could still be there. But at the same time, what if we could prove the Inter- what causes the interactions of the brain to be the way they are, or what the seat of seemingly free will consciousness yeah. is. See, that's the thing that always that, that keeps tearing me is that, you know, the people, you know, Kellis, right? He can see what's going on. And most of what he does, right, when he's when it looks like he's controlling other people and, you know, sort of owning them, really all he's doing is just telling them what he sees. He's like, you know, I see that, you know, these are all these causes and therefore this effect is going to happen. So he just tells people the situation that they're in well, not, not that they always. don't realize they're he, in. He only does that against very weak-minded people or, like, like in the beginning, that trapper. Or people that he's already weakened and he needs to finish do the critical yeah. blow. Well, yeah, but I mean, he, he... Most of the time, the way he tricks people is simply by appearing to them, by seeing what they see and appearing to be exactly what they want the most. Yeah. That too, or but what a they lot want of time the he just you know is that he just points out to people what they really are thinking that they won't admit to themselves that they're thinking. But you know, they know he really doesn't do that that often. He does it kind of often, but not really, not as often as you think. I mean, he, he does it, but most of the scenes where he does that and it tells someone you know the truth that they refuse to admit to themselves or the truth that they desperately wanted someone else to confirm. Those are his killing blows. Those aren't. He builds up to that by intimating himself by. By answering the question, what do you see to himself? And then doing exactly what he needs to mm-hmm. do. Because by seeing Kellis through all the other characters' perspectives, I would, I, like, several times, I forgot what he was. I was completely fooled by him. Like, I'd be reading from a Camion's perspective, or perspective. I was also fooled many times as well. And I'd be like, ah, oh, Kellis, yeah, blah. Wait a minute, it's Kellis. God damn it. <laughs> he got you. And But the thing is, I, what I love so much is that that happens to Nair. And... His reaction is game theory perfect. It is exact. Uh, I, I would, you know, despite, uh, I wouldn't act like Nair 100%, obviously, you know, with the, the violence and the, the uh, breaking of horses. But uh, I'm Nair, score Earth or whatever. Right. I would, not, of horses I would not be doing that action, but I would definitely be treating, I could see myself treating Kellis the same way. Basically, I'm, why don't you believe anything I say? I'm always right because, you know, he tells him what he sees and what he sees is right. He's like, because if I don't believe anything you say, even if you're right, it'll be impossible for you to deceive me. And that's the, you know, game theory. If you can't make an informed decision or a decision is arbitrary, then your only logical course of action is to make entirely random decisions so that no one can second guess you. Yep. And as a result, Nair starts trending more and more toward insanity. And the brilliant thing and I think this is hinted at in well, the first Because he just book. doesn't want Kellis to, to own him. You know, Kellis sees how it's going to play out. Nair says, oh, I can't let it play out that way. I don't want him to be right. This but at the same time, him. one, he doesn't care about the Holy War or any of these people. They're, yep. I love... Well, he cares about himself. No, he, he, he cares doesn't about, even care about... He cares about one thing. Uh, is that spoiled in the first book? He, uh, if we say what it is? 
that he wants to murder Moengus. Oh, is that in the first book? Oh, I um, think yes. it is in the first book. Yes, okay. because th- that is definitely in the first book. Okay, it definitely is, you're right. That despite his dislike of Kellis, he doesn't care about these people because the Skilvendi are one of my, kind of like how the orcs are Luke Crane's but- favorite race in Burning Wheel. I love how intricate and... <laughs> I guess it, the way the non-men would describe it, beautiful. Well, this the is are. this is why the prologue is so important. In the prologue, right, he treats that woodsman like shit, basically, right? He just bowls him over, and then he gets owned by the non-man, right? Does the non-man own him before or after the woodsman? It doesn't really matter. It's after the woodsman. Okay. He's treating, you go, you, and then you see him go through all these other people, you know, the main characters, uh, Akamian, Nair, Esmanet, everybody, right? And he's treating them like the woodsmen. It's just taking a lot longer. So you're just like, ah, oh, 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 and you saw the woodsman before. But then you think of the non-man, and you're like, is one of these people going to get him like the non-man got him? Maybe Nair's going to be like the non-man? I don't Not know. Not just Nair. What about Confess? Yep. Because Confess is also... Well, all the characters are fascinating because they're they're three-dimensional to the to a ludicrous extent. And it, Conf- I love the, the scene. Confess is a product of some sort of defect of birth. Yeah. That might be from the second book. I don't remember offhand. I don't really remember either. But they're... The, I don't know. I, I don't. I couldn't even say who my favorite character is. I mean, I identify the most with Akamian because he's the one person who is earnest and forthright. Yeah, more I so don't identify than everyone with, else. I identify with you know, I've, as I've said, like probably for the third time, Nair's you know skepticism and such. I identify with Akamian's you but, know, but when he's not when he's not going crazy and having nightmares, you know, he's sort of he's actually sort of level headed and, and sort of you know cool with it. But and, is not Nair a product of what Moengus did to him, coupled with his upbringing. Yeah, pretty if, much. If the Skilvendi culture came before, then the fact that Nair is, do, does the things he does can almost be excused by the fact that, did he have any choice? Yep. Well, I mean... But then again, Moengus showed him that he had a choice, and that's the fascinating thing. Well, is Akami and just, a, uh, you know, the, what, the nightmares oh, no, no, came before finish. him. That's the fascinating thing about Nair, is that he didn't realize that he had a choice. And all Moengus did was show him that the step is trackless, that he could, that he had a choice, that he did not have to be what he was. And as a result, I mean, before that, he was not a good skill Vendi. He was a mediocre skill Vendi at best. And his father didn't seem to have a lot of respect for him. After Moengus showed him what, you know, that the tra- step was trackless, that he had options, he went with those options and then he saw the result of that and he was so overcome with shame and fear and all these emotions that kind of his only possible reaction was to be the best skill Vendi he could be. And he does these things to overcome his internal shame, fear, and doubt. Yep. So it's like he, he's smart enough to not be a skill Vendi, but he's trapped by what the skill Vendi are and the promise of... If you do these things, you'll be respected by these people. I want to be respected by these people again. I must do these things. And as a result, he does them. He becomes Skilvendi, more so than any other Skilvendi ever was or is. I think in the first book, that is the trackless step message, is the one that translate translates most into the real world, you know, the modern real world today. Because I see people all over the place, right, who have problems or just want things. And... There are many uh, there are many things they can do. The step is trackless, yet they block out certain options for, you know, not any real reason, just for psychological reasons. They 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 limit themselves to, you know, oh, I can't that's not something I can do. That's not something I can do. And usually the things that they just refuse to do for who knows why are probably the best ways for them to get what they want and you know have things go nicely. And, you know, you see uh, Nair is in that same sort of situation that, you know, at, at when he's before Moengus comes, that a lot of people I meet in everyday life are in where, you know, they want certain things, but they don't realize that there are other ways they could be going about it. And just something about their minds sort of like, you know, just cancels out those options. Then Moengus says, you know, you can do these options. And suddenly he's like, oh, shit. I can do these other things. All right, let's go off on Let's talk about a couple, because there's a lot of big scenes that I kind of want to talk about. Let's talk about one, someone we haven't talked about at all. The Emperor, Zerius. Okay, <laughs> so Zerius, 
and all the people surrounding the empire. I, it's fascinating and wonderful, and I love these characters, even though I despise everything they do and everything right, they so stand here's, for. Here's something I'm actually sort of unclear about, right? So, Z, like, the Empress is his mom, right? He, mm -hmm. do, he doesn't have a wife. There's no wife Empress. No, there's no Empress. Because it was sort of, okay, because it was sort of, like, unclear at times, because, like... You know, his mom is old, his mom is younger, he's got the you hots for his mom. No, she might have been his aunt, now that I think back, I don't really remember. He's because... got the hots for his mom, but well, no, that, he doesn't. That it, family is full of incest. It is full of incest, but it's totally, uh, it's sort of like the way that the characters interact throughout in the different like scenes throughout the books. I can't really exactly tell. The relationship seems to sort of change almost randomly, which I guess fits because those people are insane. Yes, they are. <laughs> but they're a product of lots of inbreeding and not the good kind. Lots of inbreeding and lots of power results in no good. But at the same time, like the scene, I hinted at this when we were selling this book Yet to you Confess guys. Yet Confess came out of that somehow? But at the same time, Confess is fucked up. He is, but he's not as fucked up as Zerius. <laughs> he's, uh, at least he's smarter than Zerius. But no, no, he's not. Uh, That's the problem. In some ways he is. Because the, the thing that's so wonderful about the scene I hinted at, would, when Confast returns victorious from the war with the Skilvendi, and he is standing before his uncle, the emperor of the empire, of the Nansurium, and he's, you see in his head, and he's thinking, I should kill my uncle right now. My troops are all lined up. They'll support me. And the whole time he's thinking, so should I stab him in the neck? And, or, and then just rush forward? Should I stab him in the gut? Well, how exactly should I go about this? And you see, and then the Emperor's perspective, and he's doing all these things, and you see that Skaos knows what's going on. Skaos sees. Skaos. I, I say Skaos. Anyway, what? it doesn't matter. That sounds right in my head. I never looked up how it's actually yeah, pronounced. I think, like, Skaos... I don't know what it doesn't matter. The, that, there's so many proper nouns in this book, and only some of them have pronunciation guides. And Anasurimbor is one of the best words. I think ever. it's Anasurimbor. It's Anasurimbor. I think it's Anasurimbor. Anasurimbor sounds on a stupid. Okay. I think it sounds more uh, kingly. Like I think Ana Anasurimbor sounds more kingly. Nah. Anyway. Anyway, that is. I like that word though. I do like. Uh, I love these books. That's another thing is that. He's really got the Kiki Bubo going on with his proper nouns. You know, if you know what I'm saying. He's totally got the synesthesia going on. Like, Anno Sarimbor is, is the ancient king, right? And that sounds like the name of an ancient king. It really gives you an ancient king feeling. You know, and, and Nair Erskiothas is a very barbarian-sounding kind of name. And it, it gives you the synesthesia of sort of, you know, grr in the cur of barbarianism. So... It's like, even though he seems to have chosen, like, you know, base, almost seemingly random proper nouns completely made up, they really have a strong, you know, sounding, even though they're not based in Latin roots or anything like that. Well, they're like consistent that. within the cultures that yeah. brought them out within the books themselves. Yeah, that's another thing. Like, all the Nansurium proper nouns are sort of, you know, similar. Like, you've got Zinimus and Zerius and Confast. Those, you know, those all those words sort of feel like they're from the same culture, the same language, the Especially same Especially because you know that a lot of these languages were related to each other and the nations all came out of a very natural history. Yeah. Yet in the north, there's places named like, you know, Ishual and Golgadaroth. 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 We'll have to get to that in a minute. Oh, I don't know how much of Golgadaroth is in the first book. Not enough. Not enough. Nev 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 never you mind the Ark of the Skies. <laughs> there is not enough Golgadaroth. Uh, this might be a spoiler. There is not enough Golgadaroth in the three books. They taught you with well, that Well, I'll shit. say this. The first book, I remember I started reading it, and it hints at the, the apocalypse is going to happen again. All right, I'm fine with that. I'm reading. Oh, a holy war is starting. That's going to be on the way to the apocalypse. And then I remember Alex says, just keep reading. I'm not going to tell you where the first book, they... first book ends. You won't be happy. But you know, the first book ends with, all right, the holy war is about to begin. Yeah. I mean, think about it. Halfway through the book, they show you, they show the, the reader at least, yes, the consult is real. Here's the crow demon. And then at the end of the book, it's like Akavian knows the consult is real. And then they end the book, and you're like, ah, oh, fuck you. 
<laughs> Fuck you. It's like it's like when you're climbing uh, Breakneck Ridge where you see the peak and you're like, all right, I'm almost there. Because our it, listeners know Breakneck Ridge. Yes, but I'm, so I'm going to explain it. Nice. So you get to the peak, but then you look up and there was another peak set back that you couldn't see from the ground. And there it is. <sighs> I'll climb that peak. And when you climb that peak, there are two more peaks. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they totally, it's like the consult is obvious. It's, it's, they're basically obviously bad. They're the obvious bad evil guy. But at the same time, what they are. And again, what they want. And what they are compared to what the no god is. And what like, you mean, Mog Farao? Mog Farao. Talk about an evil name. Look at that synesthesia going on. But at the same there. time, I don't, I don't know what to think about the No God. But again, that's something we can't talk. I about. I know what to think about the No God. Well, at least I think I do. I think I know what I saw. <laughs> I think I know what I saw too. Perhaps some like sarcophagus, the tornado around it. <laughs> See, here's the problem. The I guess the a lot of the academic points that I would really like to discuss about these books require that you have read. All three books. Yeah. And I'm not going to say, oh, well, we could just talk about it, spoilers, whatever, because it's not one comprehension impossible without having read. Yeah, in indeed. And beyond that, the this is like Cowboy Bebop. I could not spoil some of the things that happened. I would not feel right in doing so. No, I wouldn't feel right. Because either. I assume you've read the first book. That scene that I was talking about where Confess says, I'm just going to murder the, my uncle, I'm going to become emperor. And how elegantly, what the, I mean, up until this point, I had pictured Zerius at, uh, looking a lot like Aladdin, the king in Aladdin. I didn't picture Zerius like I that. I just picture him looking that way. I don't know why. This bumbling, crazy, I pictured him. I pictured him more like Xerxes from Civ 2. But anyway, I don't know why. Maybe it it's the anything, X's, the X's. Because it doesn't look anything like Xerxes. Yeah. I picture, you know, I picture Confass as like one of those Roman guys with sort of like the close curly fro and like he's sort of like got the white and gold going on and he's Confass really clean. Confass is a man who exemplifies, if you had a, if he was a Burning Wheel character, his trait would be able to sneer. Yeah. I the other thing is that if you actually read the descriptions of these characters, like I sort of always messed up reading them. I do that in a lot of books, actually. It's sort of my fault is I don't, the descriptions of what characters look like, I sort of come up with what the characters look like based on like, I sort of apply a look to their attitudes rather than actually reading the descriptions of what they look like. But at the same time, Nair looks exactly like his attitude. Well, that's true. But uh, I don't think anyone's, there's not going to be too much dispute about what Nair looks like. But it's like, you know, Confess is a beard. I didn't realize that till the third book. Good God. Good yeah. game. It's like, you know, because I just sort of pictured him as like, you know, in the way I sort of thought he acted. Anyway. Well, actually, that's an important point. Uh, we keep getting off on crazy tangents. That's here. how this book is. But... When we were talking about how you see things from different people's perspectives and all that, the reason that these books are so descriptive and yet they don't fall into that trap of describing exactly the intricate design of the language on the sword and the blah, 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 blah that no one cares about except fantasy book, like, super fans, is that the descriptions are often very vague, very subjective, very transient, they jump around a lot, and... The reason for this is because, again, we see everything through other characters' heads. So you, when you experience a scene, despite the fact that you get less objective information than you might expect. In fact, like when you describe a battle or a fight in these books, or you're reading about a scene where two characters meet, or when two characters are sitting around a fire, there is very little actual descriptive text saying what colors things are, what things look like, where people are. All the descriptive text is the impressions... It's as though you're there, you are the character that currently has the point of view, and you're experiencing things the way a real person experiences things. This kind of train of thought, stream of consciousness. Mm. Like, you don't... The description when you meet someone is not, he was this tall and he had a beard and yeah, his eyes if were you, green. If you walk it's, into a room... He and, was a man who scared me. Yeah, if you walk into a room and you say hi to someone, you don't suddenly, you know, measure them, weigh them, you know... Uh, you know, f calculate like uh, how how hairy they are. But you get impressions like the it's colors of their eyes. It's so realistic in that you see what a real person would see a lot. Like a lot of times, a character you'll miss a whole bunch of what's going on because the character in whose head you were was not paying attention, and you weren't paying attention because you were following them, and they were thinking about something, or like they see something and they fixate on it, then they miss what the 
person just said, or they missed something mm -hmm. that happened. Actually, a lot in the first book, a lot more than in the second and third books, I found myself reading, going back and reading again, and finding I didn't actually miss anything. It just wasn't told to me. And that's that alone, if nothing else, that is the brilliance of this writing. That is what makes R. Scott Backer a, a writer among writers for me, is that mm -hmm. he can write a book that is so exquisitely immersive and so wonderful. Like, you feel as though you see everything. Like, it's again, it's an example from the second book, but there's a gigantic battle in the course of the Holy War, and the battle is described, and you feel as though you are standing right there next to the general in charge of the entire army. Watching it from on top of him. You feel as though you see every detail. You are there. You are actually there. And yet, if you actually read it, like, paragraph by paragraph or backwards... Almost nothing is described. It's all flashes and impressions, and it's it's perfect. I, it's hard to describe it with it just you have to read it. I mean, I don't think I would even do it justice by reading an excerpt. No, no, reading any, any excerpt. Any, the only things you can really read from this book to impress people are like the quotes, at the beginning, of the chapters, which are all awesome. That is another brilliant part of these books. I mean, well, how a lot of books do the shtick of putting quotes at the beginning of the chapters. Some books use quotes from other real books. Some books use, you know, uh, quotes that are sort of relevant to the chapter at hand, and this does that somewhat. But they you this book does quotes, and most of them are either from fictional books of the past of the world they're books that exist within the book so it's like you know there'll be a quote from the tusk which is the bible of the prince of nothing world there'll be quotes from you know some book uh, a, a commune writes years from now you know at, cause, so you know he lives because those quotes are there you know it's not a spoiler and it's like and all of them are awesome i mean right away non men strank and men the first forgets, the third regrets, and the second has all the fun. An ancient Kuneric nursery rhyme. I think it's Kuneric. No? Whatever. It doesn't matter. There, there's a symbol over one U, a different symbol over the other U. Yeah, Kuneric. Whatever. Uh, it's a good. My favorite one was, uh, I think, uh, I forget what it was. It was so relevant. It was like the. Uh, I can't remember now. Uh oh. It was basically one that said uh, "faith dumb, science good." <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of those. There are. I mean, there's an essay online. I've talked about it. I think I at least mentioned it before. Where he talks about you know the sort of a hypocrisy that goes on being a a skeptical science reason minded person and a fantasy world with magic and God knows what. And he is an essay that R. Scott Backer wrote talking about how you can sort of, you know, put these two things together and these books clearly go right along with that essay. You know, you got to read the essay to, to sort of, it help, it'll help you a lot understand what's going on in the books if it wasn't obvious already. I mean, I basically read the books, then saw the essay and went, oh, duh, that, that makes sense. <laughs> So the we I guess we should probably wrap this up. We again we barely scratched the surface. Oh man, the surface not even scratched. I mean, there are characters we didn't talk. We didn't talk about Esme at all. We didn't talk about the Crow Demon. All know? right, and it's mostly a character-driven thing. So that's really how it has to be talked about. I want to address at least one. We didn't serious... talk about uh, the campfires. Don't come to the second. No, book, they right? don't. Okay. I think I want to address one actual serious literary issue. Because it's one, well, there's two, but I'll address the first one first and see if we have time for the second one. Because we've mostly, again, been talking about, our, the show has basically been, oh man, these books are awesome. How awesome are they? So awesome. That's what people want. I mean, we've sort of realized that people don't need, you know, there, there's reviews to decide if you're going to buy something or not, right? And then there's reviews to entertain people who have already experienced the work. And I really think that podcasts in general are definitely seem to be leaning towards the latter, and there's actually a demand for the latter. Except we didn't talk a lot about specific awesome scenes and go, oh my god, we mostly just kind of went, Wee! But I mean, if you had read the book and you were listening to what, you know, if you've been listening to us, I imagine that you were probably just sitting there going, oh yeah. All right. I hope so anyway. Yeah, well, and speaking of oh yeah, we do have to note how the first book ends. That scene in when, basically, I love the, the, the complex interplay where Kellis notices that something is wrong with Scaos. And the fact that he's, it's like his face is composed And it's like, of, you like got the fingers fi stretched across something. The and way they actually describe the skin spy is actually, you. everyone totally has the same idea of, of how it works. You know, it's like, oh, it's, it's just like a bunch of little fingers all crossing each other. So it's of like, 
You know, like a, a Venus flytrap, only with a lot more teeth. It's going the techni. It is the techni. Is but the word techni used in the first no, book? No, it's used in the second book. So forget the word techni. Yes, there is no techni. There is no techni. There we is made, only we zoo. Made, we made up the techni. Ignore it. Uh, it's not like you learn any shit about the techni anyway, <laughs> fuckers. <laughs> Tell me about the fucking techni. I want to know. But that scene, the way the first book ends is not only brilliant, I think, and I really like what happened and the way, but cr soul crushingly depressing. Oh, God. I mean, it's they hit you really hard in one direction with the whole, yeah, skin spies, consult is real, a commie knows what you're going to do, what you're going to do. And then two seconds later, it's like, you know, uh, Esmond shows up and he totally just doesn't even notice her. That was one of the saddest scenes in any book I've ever read. And I was like, no way, no way, assholes. But at the same time, the... The, see, this is the brilliance of these books. The parallel scene, again, can't talk about it. Later book spoilers. When someone's reading a book and you get the same scene reversed. Oh. Uh, it almost burn. spoils, but it, uh, Total but burn. Just all of that. And then the second book picks right back up. Yeah, the second much. book picks up pretty much the page after the first book. It could yes. be the same book. But, but I think we all agree. They are distinct. Akamian was being a complete moron by not phoning home. Yeah, pretty much. Call that, home, Akamian. I don't want to call home, first, Akamian. I don't wanna. It's weird how usually when there's what like... I watch movies and other things like that, right? And I'll always say, you know, why didn't they just do this? The character was stupid. And I sort of lose my suspension of disbelief, right? Where I'll, uh, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, I try, let's see. Uh, I can't think of one right now. Lesbian? Oh, no, here. And bring up baby. Why didn't he just leave? Why well, he could have just well, left. See, when we were watching it, you didn't say why doesn't he just leave. You said why doesn't he punch her and then leave. That too. That it, but you know, <laughs> it's like when the character has an easy out. When there's just a do this and everything will be cool, and they don't do it. And at least here, we know why Akamian doesn't do it. Because Kellis is messing with him. Exactly. So this, my suspension of disbelief there's is that, not destroyed. There's that However, brilliant scene. I keep saying brilliant, where Akamian resolves to do it. I remember reading. I'm like, yes. And then he fails. Good God. No, he's gonna. It's like, all right, he's gonna do it. It's about time. Let's go. And then you see, like, Kellis sees what he's gonna do, and Kellis is, oh, man. And Kellis tricks him and forces him not to do it. And... I wanted to stab Kellis right then and there. Oh, so bad. See, it's like... But I only wanted to stab him because I was in his head. Once I'm out of his head again, I couldn't know. And then I stopped wanting to stab yeah. him and I liked him again. But when... It's like a Akamian, I can believe that he doesn't do it, so it's okay, I'm not going crazy. But I'm rooting for him to do it almost the whole time. And it's crazy how in these books, I'll be rooting for either things I want to see happen for entertainment purposes, usually involving more consult appearances, right? Uh, no God uh, references. No, all but I wanted, you know what I wanted from the beginning? As soon as the word Gnosis appeared, I wanted to know what the fuck the Gnosis was and why it was... Well, I really wanted to know. I wanted it came in to tell me. Yeah. And... I'll, there'll also be things I'll be rooting for characters to do because it's best for them. Of course, I'm usually whoever's head I'm in right now is the person I'm rooting for them to do something, right? And I'm, even if it hurts one of the other characters that I was rooting for a minute ago. But throughout the book, and unlike any other book or movie or anything I've ever read or watched or listened to or anything, what I root for actually changes. I'll root for a commune to call home, and then later on, I root for him not to call home. It's crazy. I can't believe I couldn't like I couldn't imagine myself doing that, but I was doing I was like, don't call home, don't call home. But I was like, wait a minute. I and wanted it to call home so badly just a few chapters ago. And, there's and also, now I'm saying don't call home. Especially later, because the holy war is marching. And a lot you know, you're rooting for the holy war a lot of the time. But then you step back and realize, wait a minute. The Holy War is terrible. The Holy War is only going to make the apocalypse more likely. What is Kellis doing? What, is that, what are these people doing? It's all Kellis. Oh, my God. Ugh. Right. But I can't root against the Holy War because of all I know of, you know, the guys down in Shemeh. First time we've said Shemeh. I can't believe it. Right. 
Uh, I don't like them either. I don't want them to kick all the asses of all these people because even though I might, you know, not have any, you know, loyalty to the uh, the men of the tusk, right? The characters that I've I've grown on are are in with this side, so I, that's the side that I'm sort of on, even though from an objective sort of pie in the sky perspective. Uh, the Holy War is terrible, and I hate it. It sucks. It's it's a giant crusade but of again, evil. The brilliance of these books, and again, it all comes back to the fact that we keep we're we're so intimately inside of characters' heads, and we only see things through the eyes of people in the books. There's a brilliant scene later where a character says to him or herself, "Am I crazy? No, I'm not." <laughs> but uh, just I keep saying brilliant. I have to stop saying it. But that. I'm always rooting for whoever I am at the moment. I'm always on the side of whoever I am. And the fact that my loyalties as the... And occasionally, you're uh, something bad. Yes, but at the same time, I feel bad for whoever I am with, even if they are a bad person. Yep. The only person I don't feel bad for is Kellis, because I don't know what to think about Kellis. Well, I know what to think about Kellis, but that's because I've read two more books but than you But because people. he's Kellis, you don't know if what you think is what you should think or not. Sometimes. But for everyone else, the picture is clear and the doubt is erased. But the fact that my loyalties as an external objective reader are so fickle. Yep. And it's it's really surprising to me. And sometimes I'd, I'd stop reading at the end of a character's perspective thing and go, wait a minute. I hate Nayer. <laughs> Why was I rooting for him? I hate him so much. Well, I only root for him because he is foiling Kellis, who no, I hate. <laughs> but I think you root for him because when you're in his head, to a degree, you're him because you see. Identify he, with his frustration. You of, see of... what he sees. And it, that's all these books are about is what do you see? What do you see? Because what you see is all <laughs> you, you can be. <laughs> what you see is what you are because everything that you see is the darkness that came before. And Kellis is the only person in the world except for Moengus. That we know of. Yes, and I guess the rest of the Dunyane. Who are hiding. Who can see. Well, that we know of. And, and think of all the subtlety. Look, no, because remember, early on, and a lot of people, when, when they read these, they miss this very important point. That the Dunyane were woken up by visions of Moengus who had left at some point. Oh yeah, that's so that, that's something that needs some clarification because it's not super obvious. The reason Kellis Kellis is living with the Dunyane, being Dunyane, being basically hermit monks. Well, they're not really hermits. They're because they're not alone, but you know, not I would say that they're alone. a collective hermit. Right. They're they're collectively they're a hermit. They're like monks living on the mountain, never communicating with anyone, staying hidden. Right? But at the same time, we know that in well, this they're world, in a castle, actually. Some people have the gift. They can see the Anta, and some people cannot. People who can see it have the capability to work magic, even if they don't. Yep. And so obviously some of the Dunyain have this capability. Right. But anyway, the Dunyain, they're monks living uh cut off from the world. Kellis is with them. Uh, Moengus left them at some point in the past. We don't know why. We don't know much about it. All we know is that Moengus sent dreams back to them via magical powers. And the, the Dunyane that saw these dreams decided they could brook it no more. So they send Kellis out. It's funny how it's all, you get the impression that they did not bother telling Kellis what he had to do because naturally they knew that he would do it because they came before him. Yep. So they're just like, you know, Kellis... Go out and deal with these dreams that were sent to us by that Moengus. Is that scene where he walks out into the world and forgets that he was a man and then remembers yep. is so beautifully written. And then the Dunyain that had the dreams go down into the labyrinths and uh, they're done with themselves. Yes, it, it, it is <laughs> so subtly implied that all the Dunyain that received these dreams killed themselves. Because they were tainted somehow. Perhaps they were... Someone came before them, so rather than let, you know, someone get the best of them or, or you know, no longer, you know, coming before, they off themselves that they would end. So and not to ponder, <sighs> and, and this is the funny thing, again, this is the only question in the first book that Kellis is ever grappling with. Did Moengus come before me or do I come before him? Yep. And then, all right. Yeah, or did if he Moengus, did come before me, can I get ahead of him? But if Moengus left, did he come before the rest of the Dunyain? Well, he definitely came before the ones that off themselves. Because that is something that is very interesting. Maybe what makes Moengus and Kellis 
what made Moengus leave and what makes Kellis be the one to go out to get him is their blood because the the Dunyane don't seem to believe in that that magic or all these things should exist because they can't understand or control it or whatever other reason we don't really know but yet even if Moengus came before the Dunyane but the Dunyane made him what he is so but, did they come before themselves but this hints at the fact that there is something to the blood of the Anasurimbor that makes it different independent of the Dunyane but that, that can't be because that would be something after coming before which that's is reverse before. causality it is because a lot of the basically that's one thing that you it, it's not super explicit but whenever someone talks about prophecy right as in you know this is a sign of something to come Kellis says no that's impossible something that comes after cannot come bef- you know bef- cannot affect which comes before and you think wait how is that prophecy well think about it Let's say there's an apocalypse that's going to happen 50 years from now. And I know that's going to happen because just now, like this second, uh, there was an eclipse. Let's ju- I'm just making this up, right? An eclipse now is a sign of an apocalypse in the future. Okay. So the one way of looking at it is that apocalypse, it, that, that eclipse is the cause of the apocalypse. That would make sense, but that's not what you're saying when you say that it's a prophecy. When you're saying it's a prophecy, you're saying the apocalypse is a foregone conclusion. It happened, and it has caused. The apocalypse of the future caused the eclipse now. And that is not something that can be if you're uh, with the Dunyane mindset or, or the Logos. You know, something that comes later cannot cause something to happen now. It, it, it hasn't happened yet. How could it cause anything? It's way out there. <sighs> ah. But anyway, we'll, we'll, there, we'll address at least one academic issue. Because, one, well, first, one thing that gets brought up a lot, and I'll admit I saw this in the beginning too, it is very easy to feel as though Akamian's relationship with his students was homosexual. Yeah, there is some and of that going on there. The, what I see in that is mostly a use of... Well, one, as someone else other than me pointed out so eloquently... This good, this book does not beat around the sexuality at all. People, like, men only refer to other men in these tender terms. But at the same time, how many women are in these books? Uh, two that we really get to know. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but in, regardless, I think it's just because Akamian uses very... Very tender. Oh, no, three. There's the the the, uh, the the Empress lady. A lot His of mom. Akamian and Proyas in particular, and all the all the people surrounding them. Proisha. Use very Proisha. Proisha. P R P R O Y. His nickname is they call him Proisha. Uh, which uh, which sort of struck me as sort of like a a Yiddish name, like you know a uh, bubble. <laughs> oh, the Proisha, how you doing there? <laughs> it, it just sort of felt like that. That makes sense. Yeah, but. Uh, the fact like I, Moisha. <coughs> uh, Moisha. All right. Okay. I almost lost my train of thought. That's all right. But here we go. My Yiddish can do that. Yes, it can. Yiddish often has this effect. Yiddish often comes before. But the language that Akamian uses, both in his head and when speaking, when referring to his students, there's a lot. It's referred to as love. There's some people described it as effeminate language. I wouldn't go that far, but I would say that this is definitely the language that is used is a kind of phrasing that would imply in a modern setting homosexuality to a yeah. lot of people on the one hand like when it when they start when that stuff was coming in i was sort of like huh is he trying to make this out to be gay but i sort of just took it uh at a, a filial or fraternal yes love and that value. is definitely the impression that i get that's corroborated by other things i've read since then but yeah i get the impression that 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 is, there is nothing more than tenderness and filial piety yeah People got to learn that word, filial. That's an important word. Yes, filial. especially in these books. Yes, filial love. Learn it. But you, that le- you have it probably. That leads right into the accusations that these books are sexist. And these are accusations that are very easy to make and very difficult to deny. Well, you know, but the name of fantasy book is not sexist. <laughs> Uh, the ones that involve matriarchal societies. Yeah, but even those are, they, some of those are reverse well, Usually sexist. most of those, yeah. So the, I mean, come on, like you could have like, you know, uh, uh, Battle of the Amazons. Well, it's, it's just sexist still. <laughs> well, I guess the point I would make is I'm not going to- I mean, bl- Wonder Woman, still sexist. We've gone on for over an hour, so I'm not going to belabor the point. But the way I would approach this is that 
it is set in a very realistic world. And human society in these eras was generally... Women did not have a lot of opportunities to, for advancement. And the books are following a war, a foreign war. Yeah. It is very unlikely that there would be many women involved in this at all. And I guess by putting that, by making it just a completely gender neutral world, one would have removed a lot of the reflections that the book casts upon our modern world yeah. and the things that us as humans actually do and did. It's strange how it, I, I was often noticing in this book, right? How it is a fantasy world, right? And you look at a fantasy world, like say, uh, Forgotten guess, realms. Or, no, look at, look at say middle earth, right? Middle earth doesn't really have, you know, a lot of things in it. I mean, besides trees, Right. I mean, you don't have the same animals that you have in the the normal world so much. You know, it's it's different, you know, fantasy animals in Middle Earth and such. Right. But in this book is, you know, half the things would be fantasy things and half the things would be real world things. Like you just be like, oh, yeah, a guy had camels and horses. And it's like there's camels and horses. And we just he just says horse. It doesn't even bother. You know, it's just normal horses like in the real world. Yet there's magic. That's not in the real world. And it's just this total mixture, right, going on right there. So he's obviously kept the sort of societal structures of, you know, the Middle Ages and the Crusades when women were not so hot. Well, they were probably, they were hot in one way, but, you know, they were not doing too well uh, with the civil liberties and such. But he changes a whole bunch of other things and seeing which things are just taken directly from the real world. Which, and, honestly, and, I would say is most of these books. Right, and which things are the fantasy world, right, that is that is mixed in, is a huge part of what's going on. But in terms of, uh, there are two, I guess, female main characters among one all One that's men. good and one that's bad. Well, the thing is, Surway was a product of her upbringing. Her <laughs> upbringing came before her. Eh, quite so. And I do point and out so that... And so did many blue babies. <sighs> So See, that's the, I feel, I can't, I can't dislike her, but I can't dis, I can't truly dislike I can any after, character. there's a point at which you can. But at the same time, what made her that way and did she ever have a choice? I don't think she had much, well, she had a choice, but she didn't know she had a choice. But I would put, basically, I don't want to talk about all these other ancillary issues because I don't really want to, we've already gone on long enough and we yeah, can't. we got to talk about the book we're doing next time anyway. Yes. So what I would say is that how many main characters are there? And out of them, two are women. So it's not as overbalanced as it would be easy to believe. Because of the main characters, there are two substantially important female characters. Yeah, and think about it. Those female characters, whatever, you know, negative, you know, things they're portrayed as, as having. They're portrayed no worse than the male characters. Except In for Kellis. Except for Kellis. Right, but, ev you know, everyone else gets owned just as much as they get owned, right? They're owned, everything's equal owning all around. In fact, there are many men that get owned quite a lot more than the women get owned. And, you know, as people bring up that there's a lot of rape in these books, again, there is equal raping among all genders sad, and, and species. It is quite unpleasant. But at the same time, the whole, the rape thing, and this comes up a lot more in the second and third books, not raping all the time, but what that is, because if darkness comes before and people are the products of what came before, what is the best way to control a person but to control their biology, if nothing else? Yep. And the skin spies, this is kind of hinted at, and it is pretty much explained explicitly later in the books, so I don't feel badly in spoiling it, but the skin spies are controlled primarily by the fact that as biological beings controlling their brains and their hormones and their lust controls them better than any technology ever could. Yep. And that is kind of what all of that rape is. Yep. It's, it's technology taken to the amoral, immoral extreme. Oh, crow demons. Okay. <sighs> so... I, gonna, I guess I just I don't feel that these books are unduly sexist because any aspersions that are cast upon the female characters are no worse than the aspersions cast upon the male characters. And I think Akamian probably comes out the least aspersed <laughs> to make up some cromulent words of all. Yeah. All right. So the next book we're going to do, if you've looked at the website, you pro you know, to get this episode, you probably already know what the next book is. But if not, we saved to, we decided not to tell you till the end of the episode, so it could be a surprise. We're going to do the episode about this book. 
Uh, let's do it eight weeks from now. So there's going to be three Thursday episodes that are not book of the month or book of the whatever book episodes. Yeah, and then there's going to be a book episode. We've realized that not everyone reads quite as quickly as we do. So you're going to have three non-book Thursday episodes. Then the fourth one from now is going to be about the book that so we're going to do next. We'll keep this short because I don't think you shouldn't need to be sold on this. This... If the Prince of Nothing and the Darkness That Comes Before and the Warrior Prophet and the Thousandfold Thought and all these R. Scott Backer books are revolutionary or amazing works of literature that are coming out now or that are recent, Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson is a revolutionary work that is old and we now are... We it's actually from the early 90s. Old. <laughs> <laughs> but we've gotten to the point where technology has shown us that Neil Stevenson was very, very, very ahead of his time and brought the ideas that he talks about have been mm. brought to reality to a frightening degree. They're pretty much really three modern writers, and we'll probably do books by all of them at some point, you know, over who knows how long, right? That are sort of like the geek right well, there's maybe four if you throw Terry Pratchett in there. There's Neil Gaiman, Neil Stevenson, William Gibson, and Terry Pratchett are like the geek novelist gods of, of the present time sort of can any i don't know maybe you could throw someone else in there yes you know but those are pretty much the four and neil stevenson snow crash is pretty much well but you couldn't really think of a better starting place if we're gonna go down that road now the one thing i want to bring because this should be the five minute you know overview of the book just to get you know this yep. is what the book is but i what, imagine most people listening to geek nights have read it or should have but if you read this book now not knowing when it was written, it's easy. I mean, with one exception, one idea. This listening book, to reason? Uh, no, listening to reason is just awesome. <laughs> but the, 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 the thing with the languages. Oh, right, right, right. The rest of it, the cyberspace, the technology, all these things, is very pedestrian, very done it, done before, old yeah, ideas. It seems like... You know, the stuff about cyberspace really seems like a bad sci-fi channel original. Kind and of I remember thing. I was reading this book for the first time, and I'm, I'm reading his description of cyberspace, and I'm thinking, yeah, it's kind of like that, but he really kind of missed it on a few things. But, it, you know, the, the spirit is pretty much spot on. It's in the early 90s. This yes. is like the first one. I flipped back, and I looked, and this book was written in freaking 1992. Ugh. This book describes a thing, cyberspace, that did not yet exist. MUDs were around, and that was all you had. The it realm, was pretty much a new idea with this realm, book. The realm, the first MMO, did not appear until late 1996. Yeah, yeah. This book was so prescient. It came, it came before. It sure did. Uh, not only that, but this is a book. It is humorous. It has a lot of humor going on. It has uh, pretty cool characters. It has cool sci-fi action. It's got all sorts of uh, cool ideas going on. The whole thing with the burb claves and the kind of balkanization of society yeah. really, really, really the reminded to me. The full-on libertarian privatization of absolutely everything, but including th roads and land and, and life But just and the culture. burb claves themselves, a lot of that really reminded me, just for, for a number of reasons, because I guess I had recently read Hocus Pocus again by, and, uh, by Kurt Vonnegut, and I was reminded of it in many occurrences. Mm, I got to read some Hocus Pocus. Uh, that's, it's, it's one of my favorite Kurt Vonnegut's. Yeah, it's a good one. Uh, so, Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson. I imagine many of you have read it. At least I hope more of you have read this than have read Prince of Nothing. You know, because I can understand if you didn't know about Prince of Nothing. If you didn't know about Snow Crash, a little less understandable. So, if you haven't read this, this is like required geek reading material for all, right? Uh, I, so, Snow Crash. Good yeah, God. The way I would deal, say it is that Snow Crash is not necessarily the best written book. I cannot look at, I would not put Neil Stevenson on the pedestal that I've put R. Scott Backer or a lot of other authors. Because, for one, I'll say this, I think Neil Stevenson, as good of an author as he is, writes shit action scenes. Yeah, I think his action scenes are crap. Yeah, the, the skateboarding scene at the beginning of Snow Crash is okay. So yes. the other action scenes, not so good. Like with uh, Any Raven, sword fights. the Raven action scenes, not so great. But at the same time, the way Raven is described reminds me a little bit of Nair. Do we have to read the most famous quote from this book? Do I think we might have to. 
All right, let me, We've to, said it on the show before. I know, but I have to find it. But it, this is one of those things, like, if you're... If you consider yourself an anime fan, even if you do not like Neon Genesis Evangelion, you should have seen it because it is a revolutionary work of animation. By the same token, if you like science fiction or you are a technology geek, even if you do not like Neil Stevenson or you do not like Snow Crash, you should have read it because it is a revolutionary work. Yeah, it's like even, you know, I do, the, I do this with comics all the time, is even if I don't like a comic, if it's significant or important, you know, I read it anyway. It's like, if you don't like Citizen Kane, fine. You should still have seen it. Until a man is 25, he still thinks, every so often, that under the right circumstances, he could be the baddest motherfucker in the world. If I moved to a martial arts monastery in China and studied real hard for 10 years, if my family was wiped out by Colombian drug dealers and I swore myself to revenge, if I got a fatal disease, had one year to live, devoted it to wiping out street crime, if I just dropped out and devoted my life to being bad. Hero used to feel that way too, but then he ran into Raven. In a way, this is liberating. He no longer has to worry about trying to be the baddest motherfucker in the world. The position is taken. The crowning touch. The one thing that really puts true world-class bad motherfuckerdom totally out of reach, of course, is the hydrogen bomb. If it wasn't for the hydrogen bomb, a man could still aspire. Maybe find Raven's Achilles heel. Sneak up, get a drop, slip a Mickey, pull a fast one. But Raven's nuclear umbrella kind of puts the world title out of reach. Which is okay. Sometimes it's all right to just be a little bad, to know your limitations. Make do with what you got. And of course, if that doesn't work, he might listen to reason. <laughs> this has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontroadcrew.com where you'll find show notes, links, our awesome forum, a link to our Frapper map, and links to all the RSS feeds. We say feeds plural because Geek Nights airs four nights a week covering four different brands of geekery. Mondays are science and technology. Tuesdays we have video games, board games, and RPGs. Wednesdays are anime, manga, comic nights. And Thursdays are the catch-alls for various rants and tomfoolery. You can send us feedback by email to geeknights at frontrowcrew.com. Or you can send audio feedback via Odeo. Just click the link that says send me an Odeo on the right side of our website. If you like what you hear, you can catch the last 100 episodes in iTunes or in your favorite podcatcher. For the complete archives, visit the website, which has everything. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 license. This means you can do whatever you want with it as long as you give us credit, don't make money, and share it in kind. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.